rolling. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about how to get car photography clients. It's a topic that came about recently in a poll I made in my Facebook group, Automotive Photography Education. If you'd like to join that group, uh, please drop a comment down below with your Facebook profile name and I'll send you an invite because it's a secret group and you won't be able to find it otherwise. So you can go on my channel to see the original video I made, episode one, describing why I made this channel in the first place. But I can just give you a rundown of how I do it on YouTube, which is basically I go on YouTube about photography and I try to find a reason to make a new video to basically disagree with something that someone else said about a certain topic. Hence the name of my channel, The Photography Rebuttal. I also try to find gaps that are missing in content or topics that I feel that I can provide valuable information to you. So uh, in this case, I went online and I tried to find uh, other videos that were made pertaining to how to get specifically car photography clients. There's a lot of videos about just general marketing uh, for photographers, um, but uh, for car shooters, uh, not that much material. Either it's outdated or um, worse yet, the people who are, I find, inexperienced and even worse, that they're teaching other people how to do it. So uh, this is a topic that came in pretty handy for me to do right now. So you need to approach the clients. What do you do first? Well, the whole process starts with marketing and then it's followed by sales. Marketing and sales is a common term that you might have heard of before, but they are actually two very different things. I'll probably talk about sales in a different video, but uh, this one's only talking about marketing. And what is marketing? I think it's best summed up by Gary V, one of my favorite internet uh, social media marketing gurus out there, who basically said something very simple to summarize the whole thing. I care about your attention. Because if I have your attention, if I'm good enough after that point, I can sell you something. It's not confusing. It's not complicated. The problem is, it's hard work. So basically, marketing equals attention. Getting other people's attention to your work. You can't just skip the marketing and go directly to sales like this guy. Well, it's, it's still worth a shot going and asking though. Hey, how's it going? I was just wondering if you guys need any photos or videos done. Got yeah, you got people that already do it for you? They're probably fucking shit anyway. Okay, wow. Uh, that was only a 10 second clip from his video. Uh, but within that short time, there was already so much that I could say about that. So it's a good example of how just going straight to sale leads to a lot of rejection. I mean, I guess he has a point where you have to learn how to deal with rejection as you market yourself and start your career. If you haven't been a freelancer before, this is a part of the game. So that's fine. But basically all those people that he approached don't know who he is. He's just some random that came off the street, literally. And they are also busy doing their own thing. They're at work and you are interrupting them to their daily task. So of course, they, they're gonna brush him off as quickly as possible. As if you watch the entire video, it's one after another, brushed off until he gets one gig at the end. But not the best approach. I think if you organize your marketing before you approach these people, it tends to fare much better. At least they know who you are. And there's a saying out there that you have to touch someone whether it's an email, a phone call, or they saw your website or your social media posts uh, up to seven times before they actually even begin to remember your name. So you have to do it that many times and touch them that many times before you approach them in person. And at that time, you don't just rock up to their dealership and ask to speak to that person. You would schedule an appointment like a professional does. Okay, so let's run through this whole process. First and foremost, you have to find out who these people are that you want to contact. You can find all this research online. I personally use LinkedIn, which I find is a great resource for finding people's names, emails, and addresses for sending them all my marketing material. So 
if I were to look for a magazine, for example, like uh, some car magazine or a luxury lifestyle magazine, I would either go to their LinkedIn profile or to the magazine's website themselves, uh, both of which should contain their contact information. Uh, the people I would look for are the photo editor or the art director uh, for them. And these are the people who would generally be responsible for hiring photographers to shoot for them. If I were to want to work for a dealership, I would also go to their LinkedIn profile or their website, because I'm sure the dealership has their own website. And I would also look for their marketing or general manager. And I think those are the types of people who would generally look for photographers for their marketing materials. So once you find their contact information, the next thing I do is to send them a mailer. And that's a physical postcard with an image that uh, I shot on it. And it's printed uh, by a company called moo.com, M-O-O.com. Uh, it looks something like this, where it's, the way I did it is one image per card, and I either send them one or multiple cards, depending on uh, what kind of work I want to get done for them. And you can see it's blank in the back with my logo on it. So what this allows me to do is to write them a personalized handwritten note and I, th I personally believe that a handwritten note goes a long way in showing that I actually took the effort and time to handwrite something just for you. Uh, it's not a printout from a computer which feels very generic and very distant and not personal. So the handwritten note for me, I've done it for years and I think it goes a long way. Um, you can't do too many of them obviously uh, because it takes a lot of time. But at the same time, my marketing, I believe that since I'm targeting such specific people, I don't have a lot of people I need to contact, especially in this industry, which isn't very big. And these are done, ones that I've done in envelopes, ready to go with my logo printed in the back. And that's what I use to break the ice. It's, uh, they don't know me at this point at all. So the handwritten note goes a long way saying that, hey, this is what I do. This is what pr I've probably done for other people. Um, and I can do the same thing for you. So once these are mailed and dropped off, now I have a reason to make first contact with these people by either email or phone call. And the reason is, hey, did you receive this? And that is a good icebreaker to start a relationship and to talk further about my work and what I can do for them. So next step is to direct their attention to more of my work because of course this is just one image on the card and that is in the form of my website and the website is a collection of all of my best work and the quantity is as basically as much as I want and the more the better it's a great opportunity for them to see in one glance all the great stuff that I've done so I need to clarify something here about the website a lot of people say it's your online portfolio, which I believe is true, but there's a difference between your website and another type of portfolio, which is a physical book. So the book portfolios can be generally seen as a even further curated version of your website. So what happens is sometimes is that a client will call me about a potential job and they would say we've seen your website and that's why we're calling you we think that your style fits what this job is about and we would like you to send in a portfolio now this portfolio really depends where the client is if they are local I can prepare my physical book because I always believe the physical book is a better viewing experience they can like when you can touch the image on paper, it's way deeper experience than just looking at a online portfolio like a website, for example. So if possible, I would prepare the physical book. If the client is foreign and I don't want to ship my book all the way over to them, then I will prepare a PDF portfolio, which is just a PDF and I can just email the PDF to them. But all the images that go into either the PDF portfolio or the physical book portfolio are images pulled from the website. So which images do I pull? And that's how the curation comes into play, depends on the job. So if they give me specs of the job and say that we are shooting 
a series of lifestyle car images, I would literally go into my site or the printed pieces that I already have and pull out only relative uh, material that fits this job. So if I've shot a lot of lifestyle related work, um, I will pull all those out and put them in order that flows well together and put them in a book and send it to them. So that thing that I send to them, either the PDF or the actual book, is a bunch of images specifically for that potential job. Where the website is just an overall uh, view of all of my work, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's beauty shots, whether it's um, motion, everything is there. So hope that clarifies what the difference is. Now, the book is not as common or maybe even to some of you unheard of, especially if you're younger. Uh, but uh, in my day uh, and my, some of my clients, uh, they demand uh, up to a certain point if you're pitching for a job, uh, eventually they'll call in your book. And if that happened to you and you didn't have a book, um, and this is a physical book uh, that you will send to them, uh, you won't get the job. Because for some clients, that is the ultimate uh, goal is to see your work in a book form. And uh, it, when I first started photography, uh, that was like kind of the holy grail of every photographer. Every photographer had a book. Uh, nowadays, with the digital age, uh, some people start replace the book with an iPad, which works for certain types of clients. But um, again, if you're going to presume with me together that uh, advertising or high-end uh, shooting for manufacturer is the ultimate goal for car photographers, those types of clients uh, are the ones that are looking for actual books eventually. They might scour tons of websites of photographers uh, at the initial stages of their search, but uh, when they narrow them down to usually about three to five, uh, they will call those people and get them to send the books in. And then you will um, package um, your images in the book uh, in accordance to that type of job that they're looking for. So if they're looking for a lifestyle type of shooting with talent, um, you will insert those images in your book that are printed you know, like this, paper, and uh, when you present a book to them and they can touch your images, it's a much deeper experience than flipping through an iPad or clicking through a website or scrolling through an Instagram feed. Um, and I strongly recommend that everyone does it. I even have friends who told me that took my advice on making a book <coughs> who showed the client um, who probably may have never seen a book before because they're just used to photographers showing websites and iPad portfolios. And they got the job only because they had a book and no one else did. So in terms of a marketing tool, especially in this day and age, a book can sometimes be the only thing that makes or breaks you getting that job because you become so much more unique than your competition for that same job. So just to give you a quick um, show and tell about my portfolio. It's this custom made aluminum case. Um, if you can see my names on it, um, it's a suitcase that I would usually carry with me if I were to go into the meeting to show my book personally. Inside is my book. This is my backup book, so there's nothing in there right now, but it's custom made again uh, to form fit with the case. And the prints, like I showed you, this is just a dummy, um, goes in here. So basically it's kind of like, like that, same size. There you go. And the book will be, I would say, at least 30 images of your best work. Not only that, it's, this, it's not uh, randomly placed. Uh, in order, it's, it's actually a flowing sequence from maybe uh, subtle color changes or contrast changes. Um, it could vary from 
uh, different types of like either lifestyle or hero shots. It's, it's not just randomly thrown in. There is a certain flow and it's intentional. So I can make a whole video about this, uh, but I'll stop there for now, okay? Uh, just wanted to show you what I have. The actual book that I have right now is across the ocean uh, in LA with my agent. So uh, he's schlepping it around with uh, clients. Um, and agents is another thing that we can talk about later on. So let's talk about different types of car photography clients. Let's start off with the, I won't say the lowest end, but probably the easiest one to get into if you're new to shooting for clients and shooting for car clients. And those are car clubs. I think the car clubs are everywhere and they are heavy on social media. And some of them may need a photographer to shoot their events. So you will be actually more of an event type of shooter um, that are shooting cars, but also the people in, around the cars, the owners, um, the lifestyle and the culture of specific cars, whether it's a BMW club or a Porsche club or whatever. Uh, here where I live in Hong Kong, we have a club called the Sunday Morning Drive, which literally every Sunday, very early in the morning, a whole group of car owners drive their cars on a pre planned route to a breakfast joint and then have breakfast and then enjoy the rest of their Sunday. So that there are some photographers who are associated with this group and they shoot the owner's cars sometimes, uh, but more or less they will just shoot it as kind of an event type of arrangement with the, uh, the management of the club. And if you like to shoot for uh, private car owners, Here's your chance. And I think one of these guys uh, kind of made it pretty big. Uh, joining the Sunday morning drive and eventually hooking up with individual car owners who wanted photos taken of their own private cars. So if that type of uh, gig is your scene, then that's cool because you can not only shoot the event part for the entire uh, group, but also hook up with individual owners to shoot their cars as well. So it's two types of jobs there. Um, but personally, never done that. Uh, and uh, when I started shooting, I went straight for commercial clients. Next up is dealerships. So dealerships is where I started from. Uh, I was still a student in school studying photography and I knew I liked to shoot cars. So I approached a few dealerships um, to shoot for them. And fortunately, they were running some local newspaper ads that needed a shot. And I think for them, they needed just a shot of a car. And I think if you look at the way an, a dealership is run, they, you have to understand they are a point of sale. Their primary goal is to sell cars, obviously. So they don't really need uh, any of the so-called fancy beauty shots that we all love to shoot. Uh, you have to understand that you have to shoot for the client's needs to satisfy their needs. Uh, if your portfolio, and we're going back to the portfolios now, is full of amazing beauty shots of cars, they're going to look at it and say, these are really nice, but we have no use for them. We just need a different type of photography to satisfy our business needs. So you got to understand that your portfolio and what you shoot uh, has to be 100% relevant to the needs of your client. If there's a mismatch there, doesn't matter how good the images are, uh, they won't hire you because they have no need for your type of work. But um, if you can show them uh, inventory shots, for example, um, shooting a lot of car angles uh, in a pretty narrow frame of time, uh, then they see value in that. Uh, then you can talk more about uh, getting some work from them. I would understand that they will probably, you will probably spend a whole day there shooting lots of cars, lots of different angles, and it's quantity. Um, it's not great for creativity, uh, mind you, but I would say the upside to this is if you're still starting out, this is a good opportunity for you to learn to experiment with different car angles because you will need to be shooting these cars at many different angles 
uh, interior, exterior, like pretty much every angle uh, imaginable. If you ever go on eBay or any dealer's website and they have a car there for sale, especially a pre-owned one, and they wanted to show you every single detail of that car, whether, you know, where the scratches are or not, um, they need 70 to 100 shots of that one car. It's a great chance for you to learn uh, which camera angles work best for certain cars, uh, which lenses to use to make it look right. And um, also, another upside is you can learn to shoot with minimal retouching in Photoshop because you can't really retouch those photos, especially for pre-owned cars. If there's a scratch there somewhere on a, on a rim or something like that, you can't retouch that out because you'll be lying to the prospective customers who want to buy that car. So you have to leave that in. So you are only able to rely on your photography skills. And guess what? You're a photographer, right? So spend the time and energy and make this shot as best as you can in camera. So you might say, well, yeah, okay, there's inventory, but there's, I see a lot of my dealerships in my neighborhood. They run a lot of ads too, and I can shoot those ads for them as well. Uh, you can, but uh, get ready for some stiff competition. And that competition is not from your fellow photographer who lives down the street. It's actually from the media centers that provide free images to these dealerships for their marketing materials. Now these are pretty generic photos, but they are already shot and they're free. So you have to think, why would they spend money to hire me to take images when they can get some to download from their media center at no cost at all? If you just Google uh, your favorite car brand, media center or media site, you'll come across a website that is filled with imagery, multimedia, video, that is all downloadable. And I can even do it right now with my computer, but the dealerships all have access to this material and probably even more under secure servers uh, to get for free to put in their local ads. Oh, we've got a discount this weekend. Come on down and they'll have a photo of a you know, Ford Explorer or something like that. Now, if they're looking for something specific that they cannot get from the media center, that's when they can hire someone like you to shoot something that's probably going to be locally relevant to your town, city, neighborhood, whatever. That's unique that the media centers will never have this type of image. If they want that Ford Explorer, going back to the example, in front of your town square or something that's iconic to your neighborhood, then there's value there and they need that shot. So that's one part of that competition eliminated if they have that need. The other part is can you do a better job than someone they already have on staff who is good with a camera? So that, again, is where your portfolio comes in, where you can show the quality that no staff member can achieve. So you got to see that you have to provide something that is valuable to them, just like I'm trying to provide value to you as a YouTube viewer, uh, that uh, they will hire you. Another type of client could be shooting for magazines. Now, magazines have changed a lot over the years. It used to be obviously printed only, but uh, nowadays it could be mainly digital form. But during that change, I think a lot of magazine publications decided to go in-house with their photographers. I remember a time when I met the editor-in-chief of Top Gear Hong Kong magazine, and I was um, telling him that I'm a photographer. And he basically said that not only do we have in-house photographers, we are all photographers who work at Top Gear, uh, claiming that basically anyone in the company is good with a camera and can take a decent photo of a car for their magazines. So their chances of hiring and outsourcing uh, someone like me is pretty much slim to zero. So I would guess that most magazines nowadays run under the same type of format where they would have an in-house photographer or photographers who is a basically a, an employee with a salary. Um, if that type of work format suits you, then definitely that's fine. But uh, you'll be obviously shooting just for that one publication 
or maybe a sister publication if it's under the same uh, parent company, but uh, you will be a staff member and you will be paid a salary and you will be shooting uh, just for them. So the last category I want to talk about is the manufacturer themselves, the actual brand, shooting for them. So when you go back to that dealership media center where you can, they can go and download all the images from for free, you are shooting those images. Um, very different ball game from dealerships. And you say, well, it's Ford, right? Dealership versus the brand, the manufacturer, headquarters. Same brand, right? No, very different. Same name. But dealership, like I said, is a point of sale. They only care about selling cars. The brand or the headquarters, of course they want to sell cars, but they're more concerned about marketing the brand. So when you shoot for the brand, you are more about branding, helping them uh, market and push the message out of what they stand for, which is basically what the branding is about. So you got to do a lot of research about, well, how much do you know about the brand? What is branding? How is Mercedes different from BMW, different from Audi? I mean, each of those companies know where they stand. It's their point to send that message out so that their customers or potential customers understand what their company stands for. If you look at Disney and Apple, their branding is very strong. I think people buy iPhones just because of the branding, even though the features of an iPhone are many times inferior to any Android product. But that's the strength of the branding that makes people buy. There are probably only about 15 to 20 photographers worldwide right now shooting for all the brands for cars and they are a part of a pretty small dare I say elite group of photographers at the highest level and they are shooting campaigns uh, that are global and uh, big budget so if you're interested in entering this type of work I've compiled a quick checklist just as a reference to share with you just to compare where you are now and where you might need to be to be competitive in this group. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, again, it refers back to the portfolio. How good is that portfolio? How much time have you spent uh, maturing it and working with it to get it to a certain level that's competitive? Now, don't think that it's for the utmost technical quality or retouching quality. The clients that look at these portfolios have a very discerning eye. And what they are mostly looking for is a consistent vision across the board in all the work that you shoot. And the more unique that vision is, the more likely they will remember you. So uh, opposingly, do not think that your portfolio should encompass many different types of photography, that are many different looks and styles, for example, so you can convince the clients that you can shoot many different things. It actually will work against you because what they're looking for is one very unique and very specific look, and that's what they will remember you by. The next thing on the list is your capabilities of handling a large production. Now, a large production is a job that requires potentially many final photographs. And, uh, and the production time could be anywhere from a week's worth of shooting to a month's worth of shooting. So a lot of photography. And they will present you with a brief or a creative that uh, usually is a PDF of some sort, uh, multi-page. And the creative agency or the advertising agency will prepare this to share with the photographers during the quotation stage to give them basically a test. They'll give you a test to see, okay, this is what we want in this PDF. And you're, we're thinking about shooting for, let's say two weeks. And you have to figure out how much it's gonna cost, figure out how to get all the locations and budget and people and uh, retouching and all that stuff and package it together and present it back to us and basically tell us, this is how you would approach this job. And how you can do it. So if you're not yet ready to take on such a challenge, 
you might need to work on smaller jobs in the beginning to work your way up to that stage. So there are a lot of technical things that you need to worry about, uh, not just equipment, but people as well, and organizing time and money. Learn how to speak the lingo. That's another requirement. There's a funny language that's spoken in these groups of people. I can throw out a few words like KV. What does that stand for? Out of home, uh, recce, pre-pro, post. They're not difficult to find out what they mean, but uh, these are general terms that people throw around freely in this type of world. But uh, you just have to know it. Like I had to learn the hard way as well. Having an agent is another thing. It's not mandatory, but I think in most parts of the world, a photographer would be represented by an agent who represents a whole bunch of photographers. It's common in Europe, uh, common in the USA, uh, quite common in Canada, I would say. Not very common in Asia, but an agent is someone who represents you just like uh, an actor has an agent or a musician has an agent. Are you on their radar? What does that mean? You have to get in front of them somehow. And these people look at specific places for new talent, new photographers. Uh, one of them is winning awards, but you have to win the right one. Well, first of all, you have to win them. Um, secondly, you have to win the right types of awards uh, because those are the ones that they're looking at. It's not just some Nikon, Sony, Canon, whatever, photography awards. It has to be specific ones. Uh, there are also some online directories out there where you can pay a company to list your business and your portfolio on a website along with all other photographers and you're categorized by country and by um, speciality and uh, these clients will sometimes go to these sites to look for certain photographers in certain countries. So say uh, BMW is, wants to do a shoot in Norway and they can't really fly their favorite photographers out there because they don't have the budget for this time around. So they want to hire someone local who likes to shoot cars. So they will go to this directory, which is, uh, well, the biggest one is productionparadise.com. And uh, I used to be on that too. And I've gotten a few jobs from there as well. Um, and they could go to the Norway directory and find a car photographer in Norway and contact them. So I had a meeting with one of the production managers for Lexus USA in LA uh, one time and she told me that uh, I was on her radar. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, where were you looking? And she's like, well, production paradise. And uh, she saw that I won a few awards as well that uh, were relevant to the industry. So the awards, I, would just, I, I don't know the exact list, but um, I strive to enter a loser's archive um, photography annual that's once every two years. And um, there's another one called One Island, which is a photography resource, and they come up with the best of the best every year. Um, there's another portal called gosee.org, or gosee.de, uh, or gosee.us, which is also another portal. Basically, it's a place where photographers can upload their latest work to be seen, right? And shared within that small elite industry group of people, okay? And basically that's the checklist. So if you can check them all off, or then you're good to go. If you cannot, then uh, I, I would suggest these things that you can strive to do and get experience and learn how to do these things before you're able to kind of enter this world. Okay, I don't want to sound like it's an elite thing, but uh, it is a requirement because these people, uh, it's not a talent that these people want you to have. It's, it's a skill set that they expect you to have just to even do any type of job in, in this industry. So, yeah. So no matter what level of photographer you are at this point, I hope what I covered today gives you a very good insight on how to proceed into the next steps into getting your clients. I wish you the best of luck, and if you find this video valuable and insightful, please don't forget to subscribe down below and click the notification bell for my next video. Thanks again, I'll see you soon.